you. Oh, well, I'm not doing such a great job in Uvalde, Texas, where the police, they didn't, they kept the parents away. Good Good evening and welcome to Tucker Carlson tonight. Two days ago, as you know, a mentally ill teenager called Salvador Ramos murdered 19 children and two teachers in an elementary school in Uvalde, Texas. The crime was so awful, so completely unimaginable and shocking that it was about 24 hours before most people thought to ask exactly what had happened. How was Ramos able to get inside the school? Why did no one stop him as he methodically executed so many children over about an hour? Where was law enforcement? Those aren't just fair questions, though they are. They're essential questions. If you want to prevent similar atrocities, you need details. You've got to find out what exactly happened. This is a well-known concept. Every time a commercial airliner crashes in this country, federal investigators painstakingly recreate the final moments of the flight. Not because they're ghoulish. They want to know what caused it. And that's the main reason that air travel is so safe, after action reports work. Yet somehow, our leaders rarely respond as rationally to violent crime, almost never. A mass shooting is just too tempting a moment for them to demagogue. The public is often grieving and in shock, so it's the perfect moment for the usual opportunists to leap forward and cast blame on their political opponents, to seize all the power they can while the country's too traumatized to notice. You almost hear never hear anyone in Washington ask, what happened? Instead, it's always a race to see who can benefit politically. This week was no different. Within hours of Tuesday's massacre, Democrats in Congress announced they plan to clamp down on your ability to defend yourself with a firearm. Why is that? Well, apparently the Uvalde shooting was your fault, so you're going to pay the price. The media applauded this, so Democrats went even farther. Yesterday, they unveiled their plan to seize firearms from American citizens who have not been convicted of a crime or even accused. Now, under normal circumstances, it would be instantly obvious that that is unconstitutional. In our system, you have to be convicted before you can be punished. But in the hysteria that understandably follows a tragedy this horrible, politicians know that they can suspend civil liberties. And it's not just Democrats, by the way. Republicans in the Senate immediately signaled they're on board with more gun control. Mitch McConnell, who at the age of 80 has adopted political views that are strikingly similar to Joe Biden's, low-T liberal, announced that he stands with Chuck Schumer against you. I am hopeful, Mitch McConnell said, that we can come up with a bipartisan solution that's directly related to the facts of this awful massacre. Directly related to the facts. Well, that sounds sensible. But since we're passing new federal laws, it is worth asking, what are the facts here? Well, yesterday, Texas Governor Greg Abbott appeared at a press event to relay the main fact, which is that law enforcement on the scene did all they could to save those children. That's the first thing to know. Watch. The reason it was not worse is because law enforcement officials did what they do. They showed amazing courage by running toward gunfire for the singular purpose of trying to save lives. Law enforcement showed amazing courage by running toward gunfire for the singular purpose of trying to save lives, end quote. Now, we heard that and we wanted to believe it. Most of the time, we admire law enforcement. They take an awful lot of abuse to do a hard and essential job for not much pay. If you think you don't need the police, go ahead and defund them and see what happens. So that explanation sounded good to us. But was it true? According to the Texas Department of Public Safety, it was in fact true. A spokesman called Eric Estrada told us that a school resource officer assigned to Robb Elementary in Uvalde exchanged gunfire with the suspect before the suspect entered the school. In an interview with CNN, Estrada stated that the gunman, quote, engaged the school resource officer. And during that shootout, the gunman dropped a black bag containing ammunition. The director of the Texas Department of Public Safety, Steve McCraw, affirmed that this happened. Quote, the bottom line is law enforcement was there, McCraw said. They did engage immediately. So that was the story. And again, we were happy to believe it. But it doesn't seem to be true. A witness called Juan Carranza, who lives next to the school, said he saw everything that happened. Carranza said to the Associated Press he had watched Ramos crash his truck outside the elementary school, take a rifle and shoot at two people at a funeral home nearby. Ramos then began shooting at the school building before running inside the school about 10 minutes later. According to Carranza, there were no police officers 
at the school to engage Ramos. Ramos went into the school and began shooting. When police finally did arrive, Carranza said, they didn't do anything at all for about an hour. In fact, parents had to beg the police to save their children. Go in there, go in there, one woman said. It was a shocking story. It was the opposite of what authorities had told us for more than 24 hours. So whose version is true? Well, in the last day, videos have emerged corroborating Carranza's version of events. Those videos show police officers with rifles and body armor standing outside the school. It's not clear if the gunman was still shooting at this point, but we do know the gunman was still alive. And yet, instead of going into the school, the police instead worked to keep parents out of the school for a full hour. Watch. It seems apparent that when that video was shot, the gunman was still alive with the firearm in the school with children in the school. Now, a Texas official later suggested on camera that while all of this was happening, some members of law enforcement in Texas went into the school to get their own children out. Is that true? If it is true, it's a moral crime at the very least. In the meantime, we know that police were forcibly keeping parents away from the building. At one point, an officer held a taser at his side. Watch this. <laughs> Taser, of course, aimed at the parents. Now, one parent called Angeli Rose Gomez told the Wall Street Journal that as soon as she heard about the shooting, she drove 40 miles to the school because she had two sons enrolled and she wanted to save them. Quote, the police were doing nothing, she said. They were just standing outside the fence. They weren't going in there or running anywhere. Now, she immediately complained about this, and when she did, federal marshals put Gomez in handcuffs. Ultimately, they freed her, at which point Gomez, quote, made her distance from the crowd, jumped the school fence, and ran inside to grab her two children. She then ran out of the school with her children. In other words, this mother was cuffed, freed, ran into the school, and still had time to get her kids out as the police stood outside. Now, if that's true, it's a scandal. Today, the police called a press conference to try to explain all of this. Victor Escalon with Texas DPS began by explaining that it might be just a rumor that parents were urging police to go inside the building. Watch. Is it accurate that eyewitnesses and potentially parents of the students were urging uh, the police to go in while you were waiting for a tactical SWAT team, even that some parents were asking to borrow police armor so they could make a counter assault on the school? I have heard that information, but we have not verified that yet. So, what part, what part haven't you verified? We have not verified is that, is that a true statement or not, or is it just rumor out there? Oh, it's a rumor, except it's on video, so it's not at all a rumor. It's a fact. Now, that officer did admit that there was no school resource officer after all. The one we were told had to quote engaged the gunman. Didn't exist. Watch. It was reported that a school district police officer confronted the suspect that was making entry. Not accurate. He walked in unrestructed initially. So from the grandmother's house to the bar ditch to the school, into the school, he was not confronted by anybody. To clear the record on that. So the point is not to point fingers or blame people. Nobody wants a school shooting. Everyone's heart is broken by it. But the authorities are not allowed to lie to us in the aftermath of an event like this. 
And our federal officials are not allowed to take an event like this, ignore the facts, and then use it to take our constitutional rights away. So what are the facts? Well, here's the news story from Texas DPS. At 11.28 a.m., the shooter crashed his truck outside. He then pulled a gun and began shooting indiscriminately at two people at a funeral home. That confirms what the witness Carranza said. He also shot the school building. During that time, as you'd expect, people were calling the police. 12 minutes later, at 11.40 a.m., the shooter went inside the building. How'd that happen? Then four minutes after that, the police finally went inside the building. So in all, there was a 16-minute gap until the police showed up and responded. So why did that take so long? That is a fair question. In fact, it's a critical question. Even at the Parkland school shooting, when police staged outside as students were being murdered, police wound up inside the building 11 minutes after the shooter. But in this case, it was 16 minutes. Why was that? We have a right to know. But today, police wouldn't say. So you got to understand, 11.30 is the information we have at this point that we can confirm. 11.30 a.m., the PD gets a, we got a crash and a man with a gun. And then you have responding officers. That's what it is. If it's 12 minutes from 11.30 to 11.40, that's the information we have right now. Look, at the end of the day, our job is to report the facts and have those answers. We're not there yet. So the second the shooting starts anywhere, at any time, things get very confusing. They used to call it the fog of war. It's entirely real. It's hard to figure out exactly what happened when people start getting killed. But on the big questions, it's very obvious immediately. Was there a school resource officer who exchanged fire with the gunman? That's not something you would imagine. That either happened or it didn't, and you would know right away if it happened or it didn't. It didn't happen, but they said it did happen. That's a lie. Why did they lie? Police did say that officers went inside the school for four minutes after the suspect, but then they retreated outside the school, and then police did not re-enter the school for another hour. During that time, they say they were waiting for backup, including for some reason, for multiple crisis negotiators. Watch. Officers are there, the initial officers, they receive gunfire. They don't make entry initially because of the gunfire they're receiving. But we have officers calling for additional resources. Everybody that's in the area, tactical teams. We need equipment. We need specialty equipment. We need body armor. We need precision riflemen, negotiators. Now, no matter how pro-law enforcement you are, and we are, there's only so much BS you can take in the face of a tragedy like this. We're waiting for specialized equipment. You have an 18-year-old with a firearm and little kids being killed. What kind of specialty equipment do you need? Negotiators, really, as children are being murdered? One 11-year-old child says she smeared herself with a friend's blood to convince the gunman she had already been shot to death. Another fourth grader who survived the shooting said that police told kids inside to call out for help while the shooter was still shooting. Then the gunman killed a student who followed police instructions and called out for help. So if you're wondering why police waited an hour for a negotiator to talk to a gunman who's indiscriminately murdering children, you're not the only one. They were asked about this at the briefing today. Was the door really barricaded? Was it just locked? Police wouldn't respond to a simple question like that. Watch. What were the officers okay. doing between 11.44 and 12.44? I got what you. Some questions. Is yes, sir. Behind that? You, you guys have said that he was barricaded. Can you explain to us how he was barricaded and why you guys cannot breach that door? So I have taken all your questions into consideration. We will be doing updates. We will be doing updates to answer those questions. So two days after this massacre, authorities are slowly admitting that everything they told us was in fact untrue. There was no school resource officer. They're not even sure if the door was barricaded. These matter, these questions. If you wanted to stop mass shootings in the future, figuring out how this happened would be the place to start. But of course, there's nothing in Joe Biden's latest executive order on policing in the memory of St. George Floyd that addresses anything related to this shooting. And nothing under consideration from Mitch McConnell, who tells you he cares about the facts above all, will do anything to punish police officers who hide while children die. 
because the point of this is not to protect children. Obviously, you may have figured out it's to blame you for what happened in Uvalde because you dare to exercise your constitutional rights. And if you do dare to exercise your constitutional rights, according to MSNBC, you're complicit in mass murder. The truth is, not by a policy defect, but by design, by design of the Republican Party in this country, every kid in every classroom is exposed and vulnerable to a shooting. It absolutely is partisan because oh. there's one party that's refusing to pass gun laws. The fact that we leave kids to go through the rituals you're talking about, vulnerable to this, uh, to this kind of slaughter, is a political decision. Please stop thinking that there is some body count, some level of brutality and carnage that will move them, these Republicans and their two pet Democrats, that the rivers of blood will one day run deep enough. These ghouls drawing politically convenient conclusions, accusing people who have no connection whatsoever to this massacre of murder, all on the basis of no evidence. And then when the evidence emerges and it doesn't comport with the politically convenient story they wanna tell, they simply ignore it. But the rest of us should not ignore it. We should not avert our gaze. We should demand the truth. We should demand to know what happened. The children who were murdered deserve at least that. In a moment, we're going to speak to our friend who happens to be the mayor of Uvalde, Texas, Don McLaughlin. But first, we're going to speak to Ryan Petty. He is the author, of, the father of Elena Petty, who was murdered at the Parkland school shooting. He's also a commissioner on the Marjorie Stoneman Douglas Public Safety Commission, which investigated that massacre and a member of the Florida State Board of Education. Mr. Petty, thanks so much for coming on. The, even now, for there's, me tonight, Tucker. as we just tried to explain, there's a lot that we don't know, but we do know that the initial version was so far from the apparent truth that it makes it makes you wonder. Yeah, Tucker, I, you know, I'm I'm sitting here listening to you describe the timeline of events and what we think we know, and I'm getting angry. Um, and I, yeah. I hear the anguish in the voices of those parents that were begging law enforcement to do something. And I, I remember back to Parkland and, and learning that the school resource officer in Parkland stood outside for 48 minutes. And I'm having flashbacks to what happened then. Look, we're early in the investigation. I understand we don't know everything, but when stories change as radically as they have over the past two days and law enforcement, can't give us a straight answer about their response, people should be angry. And my heart goes out. My heart breaks for these families. Well, yeah, because, I mean, we're being told that we need to turn America's elementary schools into like a checkpoint at the Gaza Strip border. We need to militarize them. But what's the point of any of this if the people in charge of keeping our kids safe refuse to engage with an active shooter? I'm appalled at what I believe has happened, or at least what we think has happened so far. The fact that, look, for 12 minutes, the shooter was outside shooting. And then f he went into the school and four minutes later, police respond, but they were ill-prepared for the attack. They didn't have body armor. It doesn't appear like they had rifles and the ability to get into the classroom and stop the killing. So they sat outside for what appears to be 40 minutes waiting for a tactical response team to come in and address the threat. This is, this is, um, this is appalling. Uh, they should have been prepared. First of all, this shooter should have never gotten onto the campus, walking into what appears to be an unlocked door, unchallenged by anyone, and able to breach security and no SRO on that campus. I can't believe after all we know that all of these attacks, that there were so many failures yet again in Uvalde. What a story. Ryan Petty, thanks so much for joining us today. I appreciate it. Thank you. So at the heart of all of this is the town of Uvalde, Texas, about 60 miles from the Mexican border. As it happened, we've been to Uvalde. We know the mayor there. It's a really nice place. And it's been at the center of the national immigration story for the last couple of years. Uvalde's been through an awful lot. And it's going through even more now. Tom McLaughlin is the mayor of that town, and he joins us tonight. Mr. Mayor, thanks so much for coming on. And I, our, our heart genuinely goes out to you and to the people of your town. Um, it must be bewildering to see Uvalde at the center of this tragedy, but also of a na uh, center of a national debate over gun control and all these bigger issues. 
It is, Tucker. I mean, my heart breaks for these families. Uh, you know, I, I don't even know what to say. This is senseless. Should have never happened. Uh, my, our, the hearts are broken in our community. Uh, this this tragedy is, is senseless. It, it should have never have happened. It does seem like from the, and I know that you're caught up in what's happening in your town, the unimaginable thing that just happened. But outside of Uvalde, what has happened there is now being used as a, as a kind of football in, in, the, in the game of politics. Um, are, you, are you aware of that? Do you have a sense of what people are using this tragedy for in Washington? Okay, so it seems that the police were preventing the parents from going in to rescue their kids. The police were standing around for an hour while this guy had an arm gun and I don't know how many people he murdered while the police were standing around. It just seems like absolutely pathetic police response. And, and the biggest story is that this isn't unusual. Like when do you have some kind of mass shooting event and the police charge in? That almost never happens. The, the police almost always stand around outside and uh, let let the slaughter go on while they quote unquote establish the perimeter as Kevin Michael Grace would would comment time and time again and after after the guys you know shot everyone he could he he commits suicide or on occasion the police will finally go in and, and do something but it appears in this case that the police police went in for their own kids but they prevented other parents from going in for their kids. So the cops weren't interested in engaging the shooter for an hour, but they were interested in going in for their own Vanessa, kids. So first I want to acknowledge the brave men and women of law enforcement that showed up to the scene, that actually were involved in the scene, that actually made entry into the school and saved more lives that, of course, we lost 18. But I want to praise those brave men and women of law enforcement. Also, offer our condolences on behalf of Texas Department of Public Safety to the families, to the victims, and the entire Uvalde community. So what we do know right now that the suspect um, was involved in a family disturbance earlier on the day with his grandmother in which he shot his grandmother. Uh, from that point on, what we do know is that local law enforcement received a call of a crash and a man with a gun nearby where the school's at. At that point, local law enforcement responded to the school. The suspect made entry into the school, and as soon as he made entry into the school, he started shooting children, teachers, whoever was in his way, he was shooting everybody. We had, of course, as I mentioned, brave law enforcement made entry into that school, exchanged gunfire with a suspect who was wearing body armor. Several police officers were shot. At that point, we did have a tactical law enforcement team arrive on scene. They met entry. They were also met with gunfire by the suspect, but they were actually able to shoot the suspect, and now the suspect is deceased. As of right now, we do have 18 children confirmed that are deceased, as well as two adults, one of those being the teacher from the school. And we've also uh, heard word that uh, Border Patrol agent was struck uh, with gunfire, a few officers shot. Uh, we've heard that some law enforcement officers actually went into school uh, to get their kids out. Can you right. talk about that? Right. So what we do know, Vanessa, right now that there was some uh, police officers, families trying to get their children out of the school because it was an active shooter situation right now. It's a terrible situation right now. And of course, just as we mentioned, the loss of life, it's, it's just terrible. It's a terrible tragedy right now that took place. But Yeah, they went in to get their own kids, but uh, didn't really do anything for an hour for other people. The cops kids. ain't doing but standing outside. The shooter entered the school armed with a gun at approximately 11.30 a.m. The video live stream begins at 11.54 a.m. It shows frustrated and scared parents shouting at police trying to enter the building themselves. Six-year-old kids in there, they don't know how to defend themselves from a shooter. We're parents. Take them Authorities have said that police officers tried to enter the building, but came under fire, and that a tactical unit eventually made its way in and confronted the shooter. They announced at 1.06 p.m. that the shooting was over and that they had the suspect in custody. But the details of what happened in the 90 minutes are still unclear. Hey, I can't be like that, man. Well, it, it does seem fairly clear that uh, this guy was shooting and outside the school for 12 minutes. All right, and the school didn't bother to lock the door. So when you have shoddy operations, the police response was shoddy. The school response was, was shoddy. I mean, what kind of America are we inheriting where, where cops go in for their own kids, but they don't go in after the shooter and they prevent parents who want to go in? The, the cops 
don't have the balls to confront the shooter. But they do have the balls to tase and handcuff the parents who are upset about the slaughter going on. The cops will go in to look after their own kids, but then they handcuff and prevent other parents from going in to look after their own kids. So I don't have really strong opinions on gun control. I'm not strongly for it. Definitely not strongly for it. Uh, I'm probably middle of the road uh, Republican on it. If, if you can show me good evidence that restricting certain type of weaponry will reduce needless death, I, I'm open to that argument. But arguing, hey, give us your guns, the government will protect you. And then this kind of shoddy performance from the government, which seems to be the norm, right? What's rare is the police go in and engage. Right? That's the rare thing. So this guy shows up at the school 1228. He goes into the school at 1240. Uh, police arrive about 1244. They go in for a couple of minutes, come back out, and they stand around, form the perimeter, prevent parents from going in to rescue their own kids for an hour. So the gunman was lingering outside the school for 12 minutes shooting then walked into the school unobstructed. Okay, so there was no armed police officer there as they were telling us there was. Uh, parents were begging cops to intervene within 15 minutes of the start of the shooting, but cops couldn't be bothered. They apparently went in for their own kids, stopped other parents from doing the same. So who's responsible for ordering these cops to just stand around, keep parents out of the school instead of sending them inside to stop the horror? I mean, who's going to take responsibility for that avoidable part of the massacre? Who leaves the door open when there's shooting going on? If you're a police officer, your job is to go in. But that almost never happens. Your job is to rush in. Perhaps if you can't do that, perhaps you should find another job. Now, Jason Whitlock has an interesting perspective. He says, our culture has moved in such a negative direction in the last decade. I'm not sure first responders would run up in the World Trade Towers today. Cultural rot has consequences. When you make heroes of people who contribute nothing and demonize those who risk everything, maybe this is what you get. We've promoted cowardice and we've demonized masculinity. And then we're all shocked when we see so much cowardice. I'm rather tired of conservatives demanding that no one politicize this event, which I think is absurd and, and rather self-serving. Apparently, we're supposed to just gaze at the abyss for a week or so and then just move on. But I guess we'll, we'll come together as a country by gazing into the abyss of an event like this. Some of them will say that we should look at some deeper, you could say, cultural causes of this, social alienation, and then just move on. They don't use that word. But I guess I do. I agree with that. But they seem to offer the solution of come to God, which was the solution offered by Marjorie Taylor Greene on Twitter. She basically just unthinkingly said, gun control won't work. <laughs> well, if it won't work, I don't know why you oppose it. But anyway, um, she says, gun control won't work. We have to look at the values that led to this, or the loss of values, and we should all come to God. So it's a, a kind of solution that we have to convert the entire public into her non-denominational version of Christianity, and then this won't happen. Um, I don't know the religious background of the shooter. His name is Salvador Ramos. Apparently, he was 18. He was Hispanic, living in a community about 75 miles outside of San Antonio in Texas. He probably had some sort of a Catholic background. Um, he did come from a broken home of sorts. Uh, his, he lived with his grandmother. That might have made him a bit anxious or uncomfortable, but that's reality for millions of people. He bought a gun legally at the age of 18 in Texas. But we don't know much more of him than that. We have an Instagram photo, apparently, of a gaunt figure, a certain kind of darkness or hollowness <laughs> is what I, that's how I would describe my impression of him. That's all we have. According to Governor Abbott, he apparently, he mentioned that he was going to murder his grandmother, which he allegedly did. And then he might have mentioned on Facebook, I haven't seen evidence of this, but Governor Abbott has claimed this, that he was going to shoot up a school. And he went to the um, adjoining lower school to his high school. I've also read that even though he was looked at as a rather dark figure, he does fit the, the stereotype of the alienated loner who engages in this kind of violence. Okay, we're headed for blackouts. The Federal Energy Regulatory Commission, FERC, is the authority that oversees the nation's energy grid. FERC is now warning there is a, quote, high risk of blackouts this summer. No more electricity for you. Two FERC commissioners are now acknowledging that, quote, renewable energy will not be reliable when needed. The result of that, of the Green New Deal that we got without a vote, a much higher utility bill and unreliable electricity. Chuck DeVore is the vice president of the Texas Public Policy Foundation. He joins us 
tonight. Chuck, this is one of those slow motion car crashes that we've been sort of watching for years now. They told us that we we're going to transition to green energy and it was going to be great. We're going to save the planet. It doesn't work. Why isn't anyone in authority acting to stop this before it happens? Well, because, Tucker, the pain hasn't hit yet. Uh, the pain is only beginning to hit now in the case of prices. Uh, what you find in Germany and in, across the United States is in states that have more periodic renewables, more wind and solar, the costs are higher. And why are they higher? Well, they're higher because the grid has to be on all the time. And for it to be on all the time, the more wind and solar you have, you have to either create hugely expensive, massive utility scale battery farms, or you pay reliable hydrocarbon powered power plants to stand around on, on standby for when they're needed. And that takes money. And so no one's really invested in this. We've done the easy part first. And now, like a person jumping out of an airplane, we're, we leave the door and we wonder, have we got our parachute on? Uh, that's where we are right now, Tucker. But to do that to a country's energy grid is effectively sabotage without, you know, energy is food, energy is the economy, energy is everything. Without energy, you're in the Stone Age. Absolutely right. And I suppose you could look at this as like a good news, bad news sort of thing. The, the bad news is the price of electricity is going up even faster than the rate of inflation under Joe Biden. The good news is if there's a blackout, you don't have to pay for electricity because you don't have any. <laughs> That's dark, but true. Chuck, thank literally you. Literally dark. <laughs> literally dark. Great to see you tonight. Thank you. Thank you. So all of a sudden you look around and a lot of people are pretty unhealthy. And part of the reason for that is the food in this country is also pretty unhealthy. The good news is healthy food has positive effects that you may not even be aware of. Max Lugaveri has studied these effects very carefully. He's a nutrition expert in the Okay, let's uh, let's have a look at some more about what happened in Texas. So parents were begging cops to intervene. Cops didn't intervene effectively for an hour. So parents were begging cops to intervene within 15 minutes of the start of the shooting. All right? Here parents are outside begging the cops all right the shooter enters the school at these cops are right here bro there's a fucking shooting at the school and uh, these fucking cops are telling everybody to leave do well uh, everybody's here trying to pick up their fucking kids they're saying that the shooter's in the new building i don't know if they had a new building like if they got a shot shoot him or something fuck look they're just all fucking parked and outside man they need to go in there yeah. Look at that shit, bro. They're all in there. The cops ain't doing shit but standing outside. All the kids are inside the fucking school and they're fucking, they're just standing. They're fucking parked. Oh my God. And all the parents are going to go in. They, they. Fuck that. Like our kids are there, man. My son's right there. They said take cover. <clears throat> they said take cover. All the parents are going to the front. All the parents are going to the front. All the parents are going to the front. Just shoot them already. Shit. Man, y'all can't be like that, man. Y'all can't be like that when there's people. Yes, I do. Get across the street. Because I'm having to deal with you. Get across the street. Get across the street. Get the street. Okay. We're going to back up. Are you going to walk into that gate and get them? You know that there are kids, right? They're little kids. They don't know how to defend themselves. Six-year-old kids in there. They don't know how to defend themselves from a shooter. Have you texted the teacher? They're letting the kids out over there. Yeah.
Yeah, uh, cop, cop's not exactly impressive in their response. It's as though we've we've imported Latin American quality of policing into America and don't really enjoy. Oh, no. Are your kids in there? No. Are your kids in there? No. That's like no one you don't want to go on the way to the park. Look at that poor little kid, that poor baby. You know, this is sad. I'm a parent to the beginning. Are you Monday? I want to go to my son. You're scared to get shot? I'll go in with all of them. Yeah, I will. Okay. Man, that's fucking crazy, bro. They're, they're just standing all outside, bro. Oh, there's fucking kids in there still, man. Uh, I don't know what kind of fucking parents there are, but half of these fucking parents here, dude, they want to go in there without vests, without guns, to get the fucking kid, bro. Yeah, highly unimpressive and highly typical police response here. It's not as though this is unusual for the cops. Shooting from the tower at the University of Texas in the 1960s, that, that was probably the uh, major precedent. But the notion that this would become a regular occurrence and that it would enter the consciousness of school children. Obviously, dying at school is about as likely as getting struck by lightning. It's, it's not something that any young person should rationally expect, but of course we aren't rational. And the fact is, this has entered children's consciousness in a way that I don't think I could fully understand. Uh, there's no doubt. And uh, the police in Ubaldi, Texas are not underfunded. They get the lion's share of the budget. And for what? I mean, could could you imagine a more pathetic response than what they mounted? Right, the gunman was dead by 1 p.m. He showed up at 11.30 a.m. He went inside at 11.40 a.m. And uh, police tell responders, please just stay back. Stay back. Just let the murderous rampage go on. Just stay back. All right, the, the school was unlocked. The shooter just walked in. Police cars established a perimeter. Helicopters were flying overhead. And the police were not going in. All right? So the police had surrounded the school for about an hour. All right? From the time he opened fire. And uh, they were they were much more interested in crowd control and in physically restraining people from trying to enter the school. Come on, I got his body, man! He's shooting! So cops are stopping parents from helping their kids. Stop cops are standing outside the school, restraining parents, handcuffing parents, arresting parents while the killer rampages inside. Onlookers are yelling at them to go in. They don't. <laughs> So one parent urges a bystander, let's just rush in because the cops aren't doing anything, right? That's how it normally works. What, you think they want to get hurt? They just want to get their pension. And it's not as though it's a mystery that the, the protocol for law enforcement where there's an active mass shooter is to go in as quickly as possible. That's been the protocol for years now. But these cops, they were waiting for a negotiating team, right? They were coming up with every excuse possible to avoid danger. But they were very rigorous in restraining parents from rescuing their own kids. <laughs> Oh, 
What a great job the cops are doing here. Arresting parents, intimidating parents, handcuffing parents, bringing parents down to the ground, making sure parents can't look after their own kids. Cops have no interest in trying to protect the kids. They're just standing around aiming their ire at parents. Yeah, so the Uvalde police, right, they get almost all the, the funding from the town. They've got their own SWAT team, right? They visit schools. They're familiar with the layouts of our schools and businesses, right? They had a tactical team trained to deal with this kind of situation. Great job, guys. Great job. Now that all children, even in lower school, are going to become aware of this, they're going to become aware of this trend. Certainly, high middle school, middle schoolers, and high schoolers, and uh, it will inflect their lives in ways that I don't think we quite understand. Many people lament the fact that this young man was able to buy a gun at 18, and in particular, the type of weapon that can be used in brutal massacres like this. And to be frank, I agree with them. I'm genuinely tired of making excuses or apologizing for American gun nuts at this point. Okay, I didn't, I didn't have a strong opinion on that. Looking at uh, outside the beltway, they're claiming more police in schools is not the answer. That seems ludicrous. But uh, there's little to no evidence of the presence of SROs, right? That's the terminology. School resource officers stops a determined school shooter. It's not all or nothing. Do you make the target harder, right? Do you deter? Does it have any deterrent effect that you can't stop uh, all? instances of the determined school shooter does not mean that there's not a deterrent effect ever. Now, the, there's this argument that having school resource officers or police in schools, it feeds a school to prison pipeline, right? Because all these juveniles getting arrested, right? they were on a path to become doctors and lawyers and dentists. But unfortunately, Students of color are disproportionately likely to get arrested, to have negative interactions with school resource officers, right? Having school resource officers intensifies the use of suspensions, expulsions, police referrals, and arrests of students. These efforts are over two times larger for black students than white students. So is there something heinous about the police here, or is there a discipline problem within parts of the uh, communities of color? So after years of declining youth arrest rates across Florida, the presence of law enforcement in Florida schools is related to an increase of behavioral instances reported to the state. Well, I don't think these behavioral incidents are benign. So I am all for having police in school. Now, this left-wing critique says that uh, that might make some parents, those coming from a place of a privilege who haven't experienced over-policing in their communities, feel safer. The feeling of safety comes with a hefty price tag that destabilizes families and communities, in particular those of color. It, it destabilizes those who are already destable, unstable, antisocial, criminally inclined. I think we don't have enough people in prison. Right? More police... I think, generally speaking, better than fewer police, however haphazard, incompetent, pathetic, and cowardly uh, the response this time around. Okay. I've been watching a quite compelling TV show called Under the Banner of Heaven. And it's a compelling look at the dark side of the Latter-day Saints the Mormon faith, and some of his critiques would, uh, would hold up pretty well for almost any religion because pretty much any religion is going to have, have a dark side. So 
Yeah. me. <laughs> She's got me under a spell. And it's, whoa, wait, hold on. What, so they're playing you around uh, oh, smoking, and his dad's not very happy. It's not so fear divorce. Over. The Lord guides my political vision. Wrong! The voice you hear is the devil's. No, he. He answers prayers too. In your, in your cheering crowds, they judge what is holy and what is fashionable. Yeah. No, no, your mother and I, we... We cannot return to our mission. All those souls in Louisiana in need of baptism, and we must stay here to save our... our son now. Flee from temptation, Daniel. Walk away from man's laws. They're so small. And this is fairly typical for strong in-groups, right? Walk away from the man's laws. Right? Our in-group has our own laws. We don't have to worry about the laws of the out-group. Right? All intensely identifying in-groups have this tendency. Temporary. So this is the equivalent of the Jewish saying, well, what will the Goyim think? Or who cares what the Goyim think? Turn thee back toward heavenly father's designs. Study them closely. His word. Understand his law. His bliss. So you've got Jewish versions of this, you've got Seventh-day Adventist versions of this, you've got uh, Catholic versions of this, I assume. Look at me here. Damn. No, well, I've been reading about it. How our church changed the rules over time. It started when we uh, banned the doctrine of plural marriage. That's when it started. I mean, you tell me, but <laughs> from what I... Everything started going wrong in this country when Mormons abandoned the principle of plural marriage, man. I read. Property who renounced it, he just wanted to keep federal troops from marching into Utah, that's all. Old Woodruff had nine wives himself. You folks, you just kept on doing it, huh? We do not pretend to know more than the founding prophets. We do not change their beliefs to suit the fashion of the time. That's what I'm talking about. So, unless you're raised in the Mormon religion or in Orthodox Judaism or Seventh-day Adventism, or pretty much any religion, the religion looks at best weird to you. And so I'm sure there are going to be a lot of Mormons who are copying it as, as a result of this TV miniseries because it, it shows the dark side of the Mormon faith just as there's a dark side to Judaism, there's a dark side to Adventism, there, there's a dark side to everything, to every, every religion. What happens if the cops come around? If man's law conflicts with heaven's, and the faithful will be ranged under the banner of heaven against them. Prophet Taylor, right? Eh? I dig it, man. I think we're pretty much finished here. Mr. Nichols, head out now. You know, hey, I, I want to be as good of a saint as I can, but everybody up north are just so concerned with being a good American, too. So this is episode four on Under the Banner of Heaven. And some of this dialogue would be applicable to any strongly identifying anchor. And deprive the family of its lawful oh, and necessary head. What is this? That is an essential LDS tract printed by Joseph Smith himself. And it also says that a man needs at least three wives to achieve full exaltation into heaven. Do you know Joseph Smith had 33 wives? 33. His youngest was 14. No, but if it's so essential, why have I never heard of it, like, in church? Well, because the U.S. government has been whittling away our doctrines for over a hundred years, but our church vowed that if man's laws ever conflicted with ours, that we would be ranged under the banner of heaven and against the government. So this is what my father set me on track to find. <laughs> God's laws and how we have perverted them with man. <laughs> perverted them? <laughs> right? 
is uh, collecting wives. Was Abraham a pervert? Huh? Was was Moses a pervert? I don't know. How should I know that? I didn't marry Moses or Abraham. Do you want to have an affair on me, Dan? Is that is that what this is about? Do I not satisfy no, you no, anymore? No, no, no. And you will not speak to me in that manner ever again. Do you understand? How can you possibly see me as the head the way I see Christ if, if it's just the two of us? You don't, ha- you don't have to go marrying more women. I know that you're the head. You always say that you can't be happy unless I am happy. Or- We're just exploring fundamentalist Mormonism. You took Robin on an looky loo to an FLDS compound. Maybe he let some of those men in his life. Could have been the bearded men you saw. Uh, I guess it's possible. <clears throat> yeah, you think? You ever discussed this with me? See, it's, it's no different than the chiropractic principle. If you're out of alignment, then your whole body begins to fail, and we have been out of alignment with God's plan. I mean, is it any wonder that there's such discord and disorder across the world? <laughs> and how could it be any how could it be otherwise when men are beset with lust and frustration? God could not be any more clear. We need to assert absolute control in our married life. So uh, if I get Brenda to to agree to the, the absolute control mm-hmm. thing, is the multiple wives thing mandatory? Because <laughs> <laughs> well, if you want to get to the celestial kingdom, it is. me of its purity, I assume. If any man espouse a virgin and desire to espouse another, he is justified. Who else follows this revelation now? Brigham Young? Only his anointed men. Ours is a never-evolving church, Emma. And Father knew it would inspire opposition. So fervent that it would cut down our church and it grew roots. We made a vow. He's dead. He phoned me a brief while ago. President Ballard, it's a pleasure to meet you. How um, how can I help? Well, Robin told me he's badly in need of spiritual counsel, and under the circumstances, he must be carrying a heavy burden indeed. If if you're here to visit him, I I ask if it can wait for tomorrow. We, we, the case is very active right now. I know. Heavenly Father won't let you rest until the evildoers are in hand, but Robin's a good boy, as are Alan and Sam, and seeing all three in need of healing prayer, I'd like you to release them into my custody. Perhaps we can talk in private. No, there's no need to trouble yourself. I don't feel it's it's prudent to release them just yet. Is everything?